Thanks, Nicole, and thank you to everyone for joining us. Rick and I are really excited to be talking about our second edition. We and many others have been working on it for a long time, and we're really excited about the way it came out or the way it's coming out and we want to show you some features of it. So we're going to talk for, we think, maybe around 40 minutes. We're going to introduce ourselves and talk about what we heard was good about the first edition and tell you what we're doing about the second edition. So thank you to everybody. And um, if you don't mind, next slide, Nicole. So a lot of you um, know me, or, or some of us have worked together, spoken together, presented together. I did an undergraduate degree in environmental studies and biology, double major from the University of Pennsylvania. And I did my PhD also at UPenn in environmental and earth sciences. And I started teaching intro to environmental science at UPenn. And I've been at Dartmouth for 27 years. And I think I've taught basically the same course as AP environmental science for 25 of the last 27 years. So I feel that I am doing the same course that a lot of you are doing. But in fact, as I frequently tell people, you do it better, because you get to spend more time per week. You get to have a lab section, which I don't in my intro college course. And you're stretching it. You're using most of the year through early May. And uh, I'm doing it in a 10-week quarter. So I'm envious of what you get to do. But nevertheless, I feel I have a fairly good idea of what it is you're doing. And I am trying to make you or allow you to be able to do that better. Next slide. Um, my own work with my graduate students and undergraduates is in the forests of New England. And I look at the effect of trace metals on soils and vegetation. I look at carbon and nitrogen and other major element cycling. And I look at, at what happens when people cut down forests and what the impact of that is on the forest, on the soil, and on the atmospheric carbon cycle. Um, I, and Rick will tell you a little bit about his research, but we try to use what we do to inform us in our treatment of environmental science. Next, please. And um, a few of you have overlapped with me on various aspects of intro to environmental science and environmental science for AP. But um, in 1995, I was asked by the college board to chair the committee that created AP Environmental Science, designed the curriculum and the, the uh, order of materials you see in the ACORN book, and we developed the first few uh, exams. I stepped down from that committee. Um, oh, it says 1995 to 1995. Didn't notice that before. It's 1998. So I was on there for about three years. And then about 10 years later, I got asked to come back to the College Board to their CDEC, their Curriculum Development and Assessment Committee, which was tasked with reevaluating AP Environmental Science. And really, we evaluated it and thought it was still pretty good. The, both of these committees had high school teachers and college faculty, university faculty, on them. And so we worked in a collaborative process where we discussed what we did in our classrooms. We got representations of, of syllabi from high school and college teachers all around the country. And so we really feel that we put together a course that at the time and still is representative of what's going on in introductory environmental science. Next, please. And as you know, um, AP environmental science has been really successful. 1998 might have been the official first year, might have been the second year, but there were about 5,000 exams taken. And most recently, there were about 130,000 exams taken. So all of us who've been involved in any aspect of it are very excited that more and more of our high school students are getting exposed to this material, having a positive experience, going out into the world, or going on to higher education with an interest in environmental science. So we thank all of you, because it's you who've been helping us, and we're all in this together. Um, improving and enhancing understanding of environmental science. Next, please, Nicole. So I started working on a book, getting ideas from lots of people and getting ideas from my experience with the college board committees, the, the committee that I was on, on a textbook for environmental science. 
And in 2008, Rick Relier joined the project and had a great deal to offer. And we work really well together. Um, there's a number of things that I have in my background, like forests and inorganic compounds like lead and mercury and air pollution. And Rick is a person who focuses mostly, not exclusively, on aquatic systems. And he looks at organic compounds, like in herbicides and pesticides. He looks at water pollution and its effects on amphibians. And so um, with the two of us, and with our maybe complementary understandings, we feel that in our book and in our interactions with you, we've got you, the teacher, and your students covered. We've got the terrestrial, we've got the aquatic, and we've got a lot of things that we do when we interact with um, high school teachers and high school students in various ways. Um, Rick is going to tell you some of his. I every year teach at the St. Johnsbury Academy AP Institute. I've done train the trainer and train the teacher workshops. And so those are just some of the things introducing me. I now want to pass it over to Rick for the next few slides. Thank you, Randy. Uh, thank you for all of you for joining us today. We're thrilled to be able to talk about the new edition that's coming out in 2015. Uh, a little bit of background about me. Um, grew up in upstate New York, so uh, I went to SUNY Syracuse, the ESF school, which we also call the forestry school. Um, then moved on to Texas Tech University, getting a master's in wildlife management, and then went up to the University of Michigan, where I got my PhD in ecology and evolution and really spent a lot of time studying wetlands and aquatic ecosystems. For the past 15 years, I was a uh, university professor at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, two months ago, I made a move over to Rensselaer Polytech Institute, better known as RPI, uh, where uh, I'm coming to you from right now. So next slide, please. So as Andy mentioned, uh, my uh, research is really on aquatic systems. And it's pretty wide ranging, studying ecology, evolution, wildlife diseases, ecotoxicology, so studying how pesticides affect aquatic ecosystems. And, and I like what Andy said. It's because of the complement of what he does and what I do in our own research programs that allow us to convey what the most important issues are, what the modern issues are, uh, a breadth in all of these topics when you read the AP book. You're reading the, the state of environmental science today, and you see that in the next in the second edition. Uh, the studies, the data, et cetera, is just as up to date as you can possibly get. If if, it, if data has been revised, we've got it, and we've uh, we've updated every figure with new data uh, for the next edition. Some of which uh, is even data from 2014. Um, so we're we're proud mm -hmm. to have uh, that breadth of ability. Um, next slide, please. So while I was at the University of Pittsburgh, as I mentioned, I was there 15 years. I served as the director of their uh, field station, where we did lots of outreach work with uh, uh, students and teachers from, from our local high schools. I currently serve as the executive director of RPI's Darren Freshwater Institute, which is a, a campus-wide effort to understand uh, what freshwater and the environment, uh, spanning everybody from biologists to computer scientists to engineers. Next slide. This is uh, my research group, and, uh, and I really like to show this picture mostly because there are two high school teachers in this picture, and we've done a lot of work with high school teachers in getting them to come into our lab in the summer, spending about eight or ten weeks with us doing really uh, frontier leading research in aquatic uh, questions, pesticides, and others. And I'll also say we've done this for five years. Every one of these teachers has published papers with us, so it's a great opportunity opportunity to uh, uh, interact with teachers. Next slide, please. And uh, we also spend a great deal of time going into their classrooms and and uh, meeting those students, having activities with them, doing labs with these students around. This is in western Pennsylvania. You see here bringing our researchers, my grad students and postdocs and, and, and myself, we go into these classrooms. And um, it is incredibly rewarding uh, to just the number of people that we can reach uh, through this effort, through the books that, that Andy and I write, uh, what an incredibly rewarding experience for us. Next slide. Uh, I like to point out 
to everyone that, you know, Andy and I don't just talk about it. We walk the walk. Uh, and, and I like to show this is a new house we just bought in New York. And what I like to point out is that we have a solar-powered house. And, and because we think that's important to uh, to think about sustainability, to think about alternative energy, et cetera. Next slide. And and the other aspect is in, in our professional life. So we do the research that we do. And here at Rensselaer, we have a new project on Lake George. This is a, a huge lake, big tourist attraction lake. Uh, next slide. Uh, in eastern New York. And there's a project we just kicked off called the Jefferson Project. Next slide. And this is a, um, a, a great effort. We just uh, deployed. These are big sensors that were floating out in the middle of the lake. And what we're doing is partnering with IBM and a local conservation group for the next 10 years to make this the best studied lake in the world. So hopefully you'll be hearing about that, and you'll be reading about that in, in future editions of the book. Next slide. So our goal there is to make this lake, Lake George, what we call the smartest lake in the world, and that's where IBM comes in to help us. So that is an unprecedented state-of-the-art um, uh, body of, of aquatic research, uh, just to give you a sense of the kind of things that uh, that we do over here at Rensselaer. Next slide. So with that background for both Andy and I, uh, when we got together in 2008, one of the things that impressed me the most is that Andy and I were, uh, pardon the metaphor, very much on the same page. We had a, a very similar independent uh, approach to, to what we wanted in the book. We wanted it to be up to date. We wanted it to have the appropriate breadth and depth. We wanted the students to have to use quantitative reasoning, because we knew the AP exam uh, wanted that as well. We want examples as much as we can that are relative, you know, relevant to a, a high school student's personal life. And the biggest thing that we both agreed on from day one is that we wanted this to be neutral. We didn't want this to be a preaching book. We didn't want it to be a gloom and doom book. We wanted to talk about the science, let students think for themselves, let them think about you know, when they have the facts and they have the data, what kind of solution they come out with, what kind of decision they might have for their personal life. And, and not to be political about this, and not to be depressing, and to talk about very positive stories where they exist, and we have those at the end of each chapter. Uh, so we try to remember that philosophy through all 20 chapters of this book, and it's really well represented. Next. And of course, the result published in 2012 was the uh, first edition of Environmental Science for AP. And I think Andy and I and everyone else we're just frankly thrilled, surprised, excited that this book has been so well received by teachers, by students. Um, I believe it's probably now the best-selling book of all the AP uh, environmental science books. Um, and, and I think there's a reason for that. Next slide. And, and I think the biggest reason for that is that we started this from the beginning, from the ground up, to be an AP environmental science book as opposed to having a college book and, and calling it an AP book the way some of them do, uh, we wanted to start from the beginning to ask, what does the AP community need? What do the AP exams ask about? What are the key terms that the AP exams want students to know? Um, have this modern approach, the systems thinking approach that you, you see in the first chapter of, of the current edition. Uh, integrating global change and sustainability. Global change shouldn't be a chapter at the end of the book. It should be pervasive. We should be talking about all the different aspects of global change and integrate that throughout every chapter of the book. Using quantitative reasoning, that's a key thing to, to, to make students successful on these exams. Again, relevant examples. And the features that many of you know about very well. Do the math where you have to do quantitative examples, checkpoints to remind you what, you're, uh, what you just learned, AP-style multiple choice questions, free response question, measuring your impact. All of those have been really well received by the community. We're thrilled that, that those really uh, uh, were, were so well received by the teachers and by the students. Next slide. And, and there we're left with a quandary uh, maybe two years ago. How do we improve on something that all of you like so much? How do we improve on something that's so successful? And uh, we gave this a great deal of thought. 
not just Andy and I, but a lot of other people, marketing people, teachers input, student input, tell us what they like, what they wanted, what they wanted to see in the next edition. And uh, I'll pass it back to Andy because he'll provide an overview of some of the new things that are coming in the second edition. Thanks, Rick. I've never heard you give a, a presentation like that before. We've talked about it, obviously, but I've never shared you, the, t the time with you where we've just boiled it down to something like that. And I'm afraid that people listening might be saying, well, if it worked out so well, why would you even mess with it? Why would you change that? And I think we're real, we were a little hesitant to tell you the truth. We thought maybe we should just go through and update some graphs and update some data and update some stories. But then we decided, no, we heard from enough of you about things that you would really like to see. And one of the first things that we heard from teachers was that a modular approach would be a wonderful addition to the next edition of the book. So as you can see here in chapter one, we, we still have chapter one, but we have three modules in chapter one. And across 20 chapters, we have 66 modules. So if you like to teach by the chapter, you can still do that. And as we heard, so many more people like teaching in modules, you now can teach a module a day, a module every two, three days, however you want to do it. And now I'll go through and tell you how that has been parsed out uh, among the chapter. So first of all, we did um, find that there were five of the case studies that we were OK with, with updating or changing considerably. So 15 of the 20 case studies are the same or just modified and edited from the first edition. And five of them are brand new. And the opening of the book is brand new. We heard from a lot of you, look how much fracking has changed, the prevalence of fracking in the United States, the results of fracking in the United States, that um, we're now using more natural gas and less coal, and the, all the pros and cons of fracking. So our first chapter opening case study is a really up-to-date case study. I was the primary author on it, but Rick was living at, near, at Un University of Pittsburgh. He was living near fracking central, so he commented and, and contributed to this chapter opening case study a great deal as well. So um, new update, five new case studies, and all the case studies were modified or updated or edited. Next, please. Um, we put a learning objective in the beginning of each module. So now you have chapters, but you also have modules, and the modules have an introduction to give their relevance to the chapter and giving the big picture. And then they have learning objectives with active words like describe how matter comprises atoms, explain why water is an important component, discuss how matter is conserved. So every chapter, sorry, every module has a set of three learning objectives after it's introduced. Next. You saw this on the previous slide as well, but we now have a marginal glossary. And it's not marginal because it's of little importance. It's marginal because it's in the margin or it bleeds over into the margin. And so key terms that are in the glossary show up again in a background color bolded with a very concise definition of the word. So these don't occur on every page, but they occur on every page that has a new glossary term on it. Next, please. We also have some things that we've added to the features that you know and told us you like, such as working towards sustainability. What Rick said earlier, the good news, or everything doesn't have to be sad and depressing. Um, we have a good news story at the end of each chapter. And one of the pieces of feedback we got from teachers was, we'd love to have some help with questions we can ask our students so we're sure they're, they're reading these and they're thinking about them. And so we put two critical thinking questions in the, at the end of each working towards sustainability. And those are not exactly the same thing, but they're closer to free response questions on the AP exam. So critical thinking questions. How they, do the indicators differ from the global indicators we described early in the chapter? And so on. Next. Um, our science applieds, which you know were at the end of each section of the book, um, they now have free response questions written for them. So there are 
simulations of the free response questions that students will see in the AP exam, and we've got two of those at the end of each science applied. Next. We heard from a lot of people, you said you wanted more assessment. You wanted more simulations of the exam going on. So we really spent a lot of time, and we got a lot of help. Rick and I didn't do this ourselves. We had editors enhance our questions, improve our questions. We had teachers writing questions for us, submitting questions. But at the end of each module, remember there are 66 modules, uh, we have five AP multiple choice questions, AP style multiple choice questions. And then at the end of each chapter, we have AP practice exams. And the practice, practice exams have 20 questions and two free response questions. Sorry, 20 multiple choice questions and two free response questions. Then we have eight unit AP practice exams. People were telling us, well, we understand that you study a chapter or your students study a chapter, you work through a chapter, and you get questions just on that chapter. But how about seeing questions on an exam that go across chapters? And so that's what we did with eight unit AP practice exams. So there's multiple choice and there's free response from anywhere in that unit. And then we have a massive cumulative AP practice exam at the end of the book. That's 100 questions and uh, some number of free response questions. The exact number escapes me, but it's, it's either exactly or very close to an AP exam. So those are some of the things that we did. As the slide summarizes, a lot more AP style review throughout the book. Next. Um, there's another thing that we have, which is an annotated teacher's edition. So in fact, if you don't mind, Nicole, going to the next slide, we'll go back in a second, but, or I don't know how many clicks you're going to have to do, but the next slide, keep going, it's the one that shows, the, here we go. So here you can see, um, maybe you can, it's a little hard when you first look at it. The book is this smaller rectangle inside. And can you point, Nicole? I think you have control of the pointers. And on the outsides, there are margins of the book. It's the teacher's edition annotations. It's comments of various sorts around it. So that's what we have. It won't be out as quickly as the book, but it'll be out sometime later in the spring or early summer. So that is, we're going to have an annotated teacher's edition. Nicole, if you don't mind going backwards now, sorry to make you do all that clicking. Keep going back to the beginning. So what we wanted to show was, here is um, something that outlines the different things, that there's overviews, and there's chapter learning objectives, and there's module learning objectives. Next, click. And so we have a pacing guide where we make some recommendations. If you're new, um, this might be how much time you want to spend on a module. Module 1, half of a standard schedule day. Module 2, one standard schedule day, and so on. Next. We have um, something that helps you understand, has the material that you've just been working with shown up on any of the AP exams? And if so, which years? And under what kind of a rubric or category? Scientific method, natural resources, and sustainability. And then you could go, if you wanted to, hunt for that question. Um, next, please. And then here, as a, OK. Um, we have various kinds of things like teaching tips. And some of you have seen this from the TRB, the Loose Leaf Teacher's Resource Binder that was available with the first edition. And here we have three teachers who wrote teaching tips for the various chapters. So the chapter opening case, to frack or not to frack, introduces students to the cost and benefits of natural gas fracking, and so on. Next. Um, we, Rick mentioned it, and we've heard and we know, and I said this when I was the chair of the committee that designed AP Environmental Science. We don't give students math because we enjoy tormenting them. We don't give students math because of the beauty of higher order mathematics. 
It's because sometimes you need to do quantitative reasoning to answer a question in environmental science. So we have more of the do the math boxes, which we heard were very popular. So many people told us they liked them in the first edition. We do more of them. And we now have a your turn, which you may recall was in some of the do the math boxes, where you'd walk through it, an exercise and then your turn. We now have a your turn for every do the math box. And in the teacher's edition, we have marginal answers with some suggested ways of how to solve it. And we have some more practice. For example, it says conversions. And so there might be more suggestions of additional mathematics or additional dimensional analysis you can give your students. You can also see some other things, perhaps depending on the size of your screen on this particular page. There's a teaching tip. There's another teaching tip. And there's all kinds of other things as well. Next, please. So here are some blow-ups of the kinds of teaching tips. We have activities. Have students examine a figure in the book, and then in groups or pairs, ask them to create their own system within a system diagram, much like figure 1.2 in the text. Beyond the classroom, have the students research a resource that's not included in the figure, and make a pie chart similar to the one in the book. Um, discussion starters and journal prompts, asking students to make lists. So all of these things are appearing throughout the chapter in the annotated teacher's edition. Next. Um, there are all kinds of tips. So for example, it might suggest an AP exam tip, how you can enhance the student's ability to do a certain question. Um, practicing science. So you might get something related to speciation and background extinction, which shows up in chapter one and also shows up in chapter 18. You know, here's some more you could do about it. And common misconceptions that the teachers who worked so hard on the teacher's edition, on the annotated teacher's edition, said students often misunderstand the greenhouse effect. And hold on, you're going to see more of the details in chapter four, so don't get bogged down if it gets too many, if you get too many questions when you first see it in chapter one. Next. So we want to thank you for joining us today. We want to thank you for being so enthusiastic about the first edition and giving us so much feedback and constructive criticism and suggestions for the second edition. As Rick mentioned, we want to thank a large number of teachers, high school teachers, university and college professors, editors. We also want to thank Nicole for running, running the best webinar I've participated in thus far. And so we thank you for staying with us this long, and we hope you'll hang on. Next slide. Because we're ready for your questions right now, sending them in through the chat to Nicole. And also, you can see right on the screen here my email address, Rick's email address, and Nicole's email address. And depending on what kind of question you have, please send us your thoughts, your observations, your comments to all three of us or to one of us, depending on what it is you're, you're looking to discuss. So um, I don't know, Rick, do you want to say anything in closing? Uh, I, I would just echo all of that. You know, we uh, make a point in the book in the first edition, and we've done it again in the second edition. We put our emails right out there. We really uh, sincerely want teachers to contact us. If you have a question, if you're confused by something, if there's a, uh, an error somewhere, uh, we've had so much great feedback on the first edition to help us make this book better. So the only reason this is going so well is because of all the teachers like you folks who are involved in, in making us uh, create a better book. So um, we, we put those email addresses right in the book. We actually want you to, to contact us anytime. Feel free. Um, thank you guys so much. Um, we are getting a few questions. A couple of them I can answer. Um, the first one, um, you want to ask about getting the slides after the presentation. Unfortunately, we're not going to be sending these slides out. As you can see, they had a lot of um, newly published and not yet published materials in them. Um, but we will be posting sample chapters and other information on our website. We should be receiving it in your, e in your inboxes soon. Um, the second question that we got from a few people is asking about ebooks. Um, we will have an ebook for this text. Um, we're still working on getting the print one out, but we will have something um, a few months after the, e the print text publishes, which we're expecting to be sometime in the spring. I don't want to give you an exact, text, an exact date yet. 
Um, Nicole, if I, Nicole, yeah. if I could just interrupt. Um, I just wanted to say that for Fiona or anybody else, if there's a particular slide or there's a particular idea that you wanted to learn more about or you wished you could see, you know, you can certainly write to us. And, and as Nicole said, we're not yet sending out these things because some of these things still might change a little bit. But we can certainly share with you the information that, uh, that we conveyed in the slide. And so we'd be happy to do that long before things come out in 2015. Great. Um, thank you. The next question I have is from Matt Steering. Um, Matt, you had a pretty long message, so I'm going to condense it a little bit. Um, is there a consideration to, to incorporate local communities into the curriculum, um, such as discussion about how to link teachers and students with their local social and etiological habitat so they can see themselves as part of their system so that um, their education can be both a citizen and a student? Um, is that something that you guys have planned for or would be open to? Um, Matt, thanks. That's a great question. You and I have spoken a little bit about this on the phone. And the place right now where I think that comes in, and it only comes in a little bit, is in the annotated teacher's edition, where some of the activities that are suggested are connecting to the local community. Can you find an example of this in your hometown or in an area of the world you're familiar with? So those are some of the ways that we've done it this far in the annotated teacher's edition to the second edition. But I'd say we are certainly, both Rick and I, in what we do, are interested in that. And there's uh, possibilities for other ways and maybe some more formal ways that you're aware of that we could add this to the material that does get disseminated, the various teacher resources. Um, another thing I should say, and I know a little less about this, so in case no one asks about it, there is a teacher resource flash drive that's being designed, and maybe Nicole can tell us some more, because Rick and I know a little bit about it, but we don't even know all the details yet. Do you want to mention that, Nicole? Um, sure. So the teacher's resource flash drive is going to be replacing the teacher's resource CD that a lot of you are familiar with. Um, it's a USB flash drive, so it can be used in almost any device and some tablets. Um, we know a lot of devices currently don't have CD drives, so um, we didn't want to limit anyone. Um, the teacher's resource flash drive is going to have a lot of information. There will be some built-in professional development, such as videos. Um, and other resources from teachers across the country. Um, it's going to have, um, I believe, PowerPoint presentations that you can use in your classroom. Um, it will have, um, um, beyond the presentations, it will also have worksheets and other things that you can use in your classroom, a lot of principal, principals, um, pacing guides, stuff like that. Um, that's still in the works. So we don't have all the details hammered out, but we do have um, it's mostly everything that's going to be that was included in the teacher's resource binder or CD from the first edition that's being updated for the second edition. Um, we do have a couple more questions. Uh, the first one, have either of you got, this is coming from Pam. Do you guys, um, are you guys considering coming to a reading in an AP reading in June? Um, Hi, Pam. Um, this is this is Andy. Rick, do you want to answer first? I, I was saying um, my schedule in June is, is still up in the air. I I, uh, I don't know if, if we're attending or not. Do you know, Andy? So I don't know for sure, but um, I know that one or both of us are going to try to get to NSTA in Chicago in March, and one or both of us are going to try to get to the reading in June. So neither of neither Rick nor I are participating in the reading, but once or twice we have gone and met with a number of people and talked to a lot of people, and talking to readers is um, a great way to learn a lot of things. So um, our plans aren't finalized, but the answer is hopefully one or both of us at NSTA and um, the reading. Yes, I'll add to that. I, I went to. Uh, uh a meeting. It was after the, the readers had finished their day, and uh, there must have been a hundred of them that we uh, got to meet. We had a great uh, um, uh, reception 
um, took over a, a whole restaurant and uh, had a fantastic time meeting the teachers and, uh, and and talking to them about what they liked and what they wanted to see. And that, those are really helpful in, in uh, thinking about this next edition that's coming out now. So um, I certainly hope we can do it again because I had a, a great time doing it. I know Andy does too. Um, the next question we have is from Kurt asking about media linked to various topics so that students can read an online text and then jump to a video or animation. Um, Kurt, I will tell you that right now our ebook does support you know videos and animation. So if you do buy the print plus ebook, we will be able to have that option. We also have a companion site which is free, and that'll have some of the videos and other resources available in the ebook. Um, that won't be live until probably late spring. Um, the websites do tend to take a little bit longer. Um, so we'll definitely give you more specific information on that um, as we finish it up. Um, Eric has another has a question um, about the way the textbook is broken up. So Rick and Andy can jump in on this one. Are the chapters broken up so that there is more in-depth information on the units that are more important to the test, or do all of the units receive an equal weight? Well, I think uh, hmm, that's a really interesting. interesting. Go ahead, Rick. I was going to say I, I think the units are are fairly similar in size. Uh, certainly, some chapters are longer than others. Some some chapters we knew from talking to teachers they wanted more time, so we would break them into more modules. Um, if, if they were more challenging, and we heard that from teachers, we would break them into smaller modules and, and spend more time uh, doing that. And uh, so. So what I think we try to do is, is think about all the topics that need to be covered and then thinking about the, the amount of time we spend on things is, is not just in terms of the importance of the issue, but also uh, the challenge that students historically have had understanding the issue, like, for example, biogeochemical cycles. That's a really hard one for all of us to, to get students excited about and get them to learn. So. I think those are the kind of things that we would think about in terms of not just their importance, but the uh, uh, the challenge and, and the students learning this in the past, and, and that helped us expand uh, certain areas more than others. Uh, the only thing I'd add to that is that we also, in the annotated uh, teacher's edition, there are comments from the three experienced AP environmental science teachers about this is a really important part or this has shown up in free response questions three times in the last X years. So those are the kinds of things that can help do a little bit more of the weighting, uh, adding weight to certain things. Uh, relative to the number of pages you might see about them. Okay. Um, the next question that we received is from Debbie about professional development opportunities with the second edition. Um, I can answer that pretty quickly. We are, um, there will be some professional development built into the textbook, um, some videos and, you know, other resources that you can use. We are also working on, um, taking some of our older videos from the first edition. I know Andy did a ton of great environmental science professional development videos with us in the past couple years, and we're working to get them available for all adopters. So you should be receiving information on that as well. We have a um, YouTube page, um, CSW High School, where we are constantly posting new videos um, mm -hmm. and new information and resources. So you can definitely check that out. Um, but I don't know if there's anything specific besides we always send our books to the AP Summer Institute. Um, I can tell you that the second edition will definitely be available and at the Summer Institute. Um, so if you plan on attending one of those, you can probably watch out for it. Um, but beyond that, I don't think we have anything specific planned. Rick and Andy, do you need, want anything to add to that? Well, I'll just add that um, it was actually Nat Draper and one of his uh, a math teacher colleague in Virginia who did a number of those videos. So I don't know if that's all of them, but I just wanted to mention Nat because he did a lot of work on that. Um, great. Uh, the next question we have is from Michael. Um, one great resource that another AP textbook has provided was primary literature that relates directly to a diagram or part of the text. Um, this included a series of questions to get students to know how to, um, to get students working with how to read primary literature, literature and how to break down the experiment 
is there some type of resource like this available with your text, or do you have any suggestions of books, um, nonfiction books that you would supplement in your AP Environmental Science course? Well, I guess my first response is that um, there's an awful lot of literature that is noted in each chapter um, in, in the different uh, stories. You know, when you look at figures, there's sources of data cited there, so there's lots of uh, um, literature to go to. Some of those are really nice. Um, for example, United Nations reports that are written for really public consumption that you can get the uh, you know, state of the globe, those kind of uh, reports that we uh, provide full citations to. In fact, we not only get citations, if, if it's available online, we give the uh, URL link that you can just go there and, and download it yourself and, and, uh, and look through that sort of thing. Yes, yeah, so we definitely um, have the, the references in various places. And one thing I believe we did, I, I hope this will work out well for people, is we took the additional reading kind of list of literature at the end of the chapter, and we've moved that to the annotated teacher's edition. But that will not be in the textbook in the second edition, I don't think. Great. Um, we do have one more question. Um, this is the last question that has come through the chat. So um, anyone listening, if you have any more questions or comments, um, you know, please send it to me right now. Um, this question comes from Eric. Are there any sections that are in the first edition that you didn't feel were important um, to include in the second edition? Have they been removed? And you gave the example that fracking was something that is new and has been added to the second edition. But is there any other? Um, resources or any other um, topics that you cover that you didn't cover in the first edition? So uh, I think each Let's of see, us we had, Yeah, we had our list. Yeah, each of us can speak to, you know, Andy and I uh, uh, wrote approximately half each. So I think in the, that the chapters that I wrote, I don't recall taking much out, but I do know we added uh, more information in new studies, et cetera. Um, but uh, I don't know, you recall, Andy, I don't recall taking any sections out as undesirable or unneeded or anything like that, did you? So I did take a little bit out in the last chapter, um, Sustainability, Economics, and Equity. We had a lot of material on micro-lending that some of you may have heard about, but it's now been the idea that you give a $50 loan to someone in a developing country and it, and it grows and there's a lot of community support to pay it back. There's now been some criticism in the social science literature suggesting that maybe that's not working as well as it was reported. So I definitely um, brought that down a little bit. And like you mentioned, fracking is expanded. Information about the change of the electricity mix in the United States, which only a few years ago was more than 50% coal, and it's now below 40% coal. The greater amounts of wind that are prevalent as part of the fuel mix in a lot of countries. Um, so there's a lot of updating, but there weren't too many things eliminated. The one I mentioned on micro-lending was one. And I know, Rick, we had a list, and I'm not remembering too many of them, but I know we had a list of things that we thought didn't get enough attention. And one that was coming to mind for one of your chapters, Rick, was um, ocean acidification. Is that one that you ended up adding some material on? Yes, I, I, I think there was uh, just maybe a brief mention of it in the first edition. It seemed to be growing in importance as an issue, so we provided complete coverage of, of that sort of uh, on the level that the rest of the book has. Um, but absolutely, the rest is, is really updated. In fact, um, I just updated, I think two weeks ago, the uh, the latest Ebola uh, outbreak in uh in the chapter that talks about human diseases and human diseases coming from wildlife, et cetera. So um, we are going through the final stages of, uh, of these pages right now. So Andy and I still have the opportunity uh, just, you know, months before the final book is coming out, and we are still providing updates to that information. So when you get it, it is just as current as, it's, as humanly possible. Um, and we, we've done that throughout. So we did it as we went through the entire second edition, as we rewrote it, 
uh, in sort of manuscript Microsoft Word form. We went through every part of that, and if we missed something, our editors asked us, is there any more recent data available? And, and just to make sure we didn't miss anything, um, and when we had the opportunity, even now, and this is, I think, three weeks ago I did this, uh, maybe that's four or five months before the book comes out, we still have that opportunity, and we're still asking ourselves the question, what is new? What can we add? Uh, because we want this to be the representation of the latest information so your students aren't reading something that's, that's 10-year-old information, but it really is the state of environmental science today. Here's another one, Rick, I recall we did. It, I discuss it in Chapter 1, you discuss it in Chapter 18, and that's the question of how many species extinctions are there per year and how many species are there in the world. So we, Rick, you might as well describe it because you just called the literature to come up with those numbers. Yeah, so, so we have some numbers that, uh, if, if, if you know much about this debate, there's a lot of debate about how many species there are, how many extinctions there are, and those are really difficult things to estimate because if you don't know how many species there are, it's really tough to estimate then how many are going extinct per year and how does that compare to centuries ago before humans were having big impacts. Uh, so one of the things that I did is went and said, what is the, the, the one of the most recent studies asking this question? And we found a, a new revised estimate of um, the number of species going extinct per year, which is uh, quite a bit lower, I think, than, than what we reported in the first edition, which was, at the time, the latest science. Um, but this is a, an article published, I think, summer of 2014, and we updated that information. So we continually are looking to make sure we've got the, the latest information to tell the students, because they, we want them to have the right facts uh, as we currently know them. Well, I kind of sense that there's a lot of attendees still on, so um, I don't know if you just want to hear more about the book, if you have specific questions, but I'll just take the opportunity to thank Nicole for running this and to thank my co-author, Rick, for being my co-author and for doing a great webinar, and I want to thank all of you, and we really mean it when we say send us an email if there are things you think of five minutes after we hang up on this webinar. Send us the questions and we would love to engage in a dialogue and comments that have just been made. Should there be things that are expanded on in the third edition, whatever it is you want to talk about, let us know. And, and we've really enjoyed the interaction. And thank you, everybody, for participating in this webinar. Yes, I, I want to uh, echo Andy's comments. Uh, we are incredibly appreciative. We're so fortunate. We've got a great team of people, including Nicole hosting the webinar. We've got a huge number of people in the editorial staff, et cetera. But frankly, the biggest asset we have are the high school teachers who are teaching this. And when we say give us feedback, we really mean it. When the second edition comes out, you will notice that so much of the feedback that many of you have given, we listen to it. We incorporate it. When we go to uh, meet the readers, we ask them, you know, what do you want to see in the next one? We incorporate those comments. You are the biggest source of information that we have. As we said, we built this from the ground up with AP high school science teachers. That's never going to stop. And we thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight. And, and uh, we, we do want to hear your continued feedback over the years. So thank you. And thank you guys for such a, a wonderful introduction to the second edition. Um, I can tell you our chat, my chat right now is just blowing up with thank you and when can we see it. Um, so everyone I think is getting very excited about the new edition coming out. Like I said, it won't be available until um, early springtime, but we will be posting a sample chapter on our catalog page. Um, so definitely keep an eye out for that. Um, and if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to email either myself, Andy, or Rick. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. So long. Thank you. Bye-bye.